continuing on with our lecture series. This is part three of 12 Elite DKG. In this particular lecture, we will discuss several things um, with the first being, how do we actually um, read the 12 Elite? What are we looking at? What areas are we looking at? Um, because it's going to be very important to identify these areas while you are trying to localize the um, areas of issue, particularly AMI, STEMI, things like that. So your first steps for 12 lead interpretation is going to be, did all the leads print? You've now went from just printing one lead at a time to get your six second strip to 12 leads at one time. Uh, in order for you to get an accurate lead uh, or an accurate print off, all of your leads have to be on um, correctly, as we mentioned in earlier lectures. Um, and also, we need to identify as their artifact present because, again, it's very important that you um, make sure that you are not moving around. You need to make sure that your patient is still whenever you're trying to print off your 12 lead because your uh, 12 lead EKG is actually a little more sensitive when you're trying to get all of the leads. And really, it's pointless to print off a 12 lead ECG if you're not getting all of your leads because you want to be able to tell all of the different areas that this will provide. Uh, also, look at your rate. Is it at one of the extremes? Uh, is it too fast, too slow? Because um, that could also be an indication of uh, a inappropriate print off. Now, as far as the print off itself, if you look at this right here, this is what your normal 12 lead is going to be in the area. Now, this little chart right here is actually giving you an idea of what the vessels are that are in relation with the different leads. Now, these leads that each different color represents what we call contiguous leads, or leads that look at the same area of the heart. Now, it's very important when we're trying to localize AMI or trying to identify areas of um, injury or ischemia or eruption, um, that we are able to identify the contiguous leads, and then we'll also discuss reciprocal leads here in the, uh, in the near future. Now, your uh, standard format, 8.5 by 11 inch paper, your 12 leaf format, you're always going to start in uh, from the, uh, the left side, go into the right side, leads 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. So these again are your precordial leads and uh, so these are your precordial or your chest leads, also known as your vector leads. You've got your augmented leads, and then you've got your standard limb leads, with lead two being your monitoring lead. But in this case, we are actually printing off the 12 lead as more of a diagnostic. Um, another way to remember uh, the different areas I see all leads. Now, this isn't in per, the, the same particular order, um, but this is a way to help you remember at least the areas that it's looking at with I being the interior portion, which is leads 2, 3, and AVF, S being the septal area, which is V1 and V2, uh, all being interior, which is V3 and V4, and lateral, which is going to be leads 1 and AVL for your high lateral. Again, this is going to be the left lateral or your left ventricular uh, wall. And then V5 and V6 is going to be lower lateral. So as far as interpretation of the 12 lead, you should at this point already know how to uh, consistently read a lead print off to get your um, arrhythmias. Uh, that's going to be rate, rhythm, P wave, PR interval, and QRS complex. Now, here's the most important things that we're looking for initially, and this is going to be for patients with severe uh, respiratory distress, dyspnea, and, of course, uh, chest pain. ST depression, ST elevation. Also, we're going to look for the presence of acute wave. 
Now, we do learn that you do see um, very small Q waves uh, from time to time, but we're talking about pathological Q waves here. These are going to be very deep Q waves that have developed after you have experienced ST um, elevation and now you've moved into um, uh, necrosis of the tissue. Now, sometimes this can be an old finding from an old MI, but in the presence of severe chain and all that, we are certainly going to um, make sure that we um, pay particular attention to this, these three things. The 5 plus 3 approach. So rate, rhythm, P wave, PRI interval, and QRS complex. Oftentimes you can look at your monitoring strip at the bottom, which is often a lead to strip. And then ST depression, ST elevation, and Q wave. So in the normal 12 lead, it records the same series of electrical events. So again, just one electrical conduction seen by 12 different cameras. Again, this is so important that you understand this, that it is just one conduction that is being viewed by several different areas. It allows for examination of the heart in two planes. As we discussed in previous lecture, you've got your frontal plane, which is going to be your... Um, your standard limb leads and your um, augmented leads. And then you've got your horizontal plane, which is what we've just started learning about today. And that is V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. You can detect many abnormalities within the 12 lead. It does not provide any information about the heart's pumping efficiency, but you can use deductive reasoning, critical thinking, um, and the skills that you've learned through learning what is uh, normal and now learning what is abnormal to determine, hey, at least we can identify that th these may be the areas that have issues uh, mechanically with the heart as well. So this is an example of a normal 12 lead. You notice that you've got your P wave, your QRS, there's nothing abnormal um, here. Um, you've got your changes in your QRS as you are um, moving through from V1 to V6. Also though, I do want to make mention that there up here, as we mentioned in a previous lecture, uh, it already calculates axis for you, so your QRS axis is 54 degrees. So if you remember your quadrant method and your hexaxial reference system and all of that, this is 0 degrees and this is 90 degrees. And so somewhere right in here would be around that area. So again, this is a normal a normal um, axis. You can also look at lead 1 in AVF and you notice that they're both positive. So again that tells you that I'm within the normal range on axis. I notice my ST segment or I found my J point, my ST segment and it is baseline. It's not elevated or depressed so again this is a normal 12 lead ECG. So, again, as you are uh, learning where to look, your um, leads one, leads AVL, that is high lateral, those are contiguous, uh, and V5 and V6, that's low lateral. Leads two, three, and AVF, that's going to be inferior, so again, the inferior wall of the left ventricle, and even maybe because of a little bit of inferior of the right as well. We'll discuss that coming up. Um, and then V1 and V2, that's going to be septal wall. V1 is directly over the interventricular septum, so this is going to be an excellent place for you to, to determine bundle branch block. Um, V3 and V4, that is going to be anterior wall. And then V5 and V6, that's going to be lateral wall. Now, what you do notice here in your standard limb lead, I mean, your standard 12 lead, excuse me, um, is that you don't have um, posterior leads. Now, early on in early lectures, I mentioned that there are uh, 15 and 18 lead uh, ECGs as well. 
those continue on around and actually give you posterior views as well. Now we can actually look at some areas um, for what we call reciprocal changes, which we'll mention a little bit later, and that could give us an indication of a posterior MI. As we're moving forward in the lecture, again, one of the most important areas for the paramedic to be proficient in 12 lead interpretation is going to be the identification of MI. Guys, you've got to be proficient in this area and you've got to be confident in this area. You can't just hook a 12 lead up and allow the machine to, uh, to, to um, interpret it for you. You've got to be able to interpret it yourself and trust yourself in it. It is very critical that you're able to do this because oftentimes you're one of the first people that they come in contact with. And so you've got to be the patient advocate. You've got to be the person that is able to coordinate the care from the time that they call 911 to the time you drop them off. These patients do not need to hang out in the ER for a very long time. They need to get to the cath lab. Remember, time is muscle. Currently, the American Heart Association recommends a door to balloon time of less than 90 minutes and a door to needle time of less than 30 minutes. But we need to make sure that we're working on the EMS to balloon time. So that means that we do not want to stay a long time. Once we have identified that, hey, this is a possible MI, we need to make sure that we are getting these patients to the appropriate facility uh, that has the capabilities to do the the. Um, interventions that are required. Uh, our EMS to balloon time, this is the time from EMS patient contact to definitive therapy. The door to balloon time, again, this is a, uh, a, a time of less than 90 minutes. This is the time from presentation to the hospital to definitive therapy. And then you have the door to needle time. And this is the time from presentation to the ED and ends when a fibrinolytic medication is administered. Now, you're not always going to have fibrinolytics or affectionately called clot busters, and you're not always going to have definitive therapy, but that is not for us to decide. Um, we just must perform the steps to make sure the patient has the best chance. Rapid identification is a most important factor in decreasing EMS to balloon time, and might I add that rapid identification with confidence in yourself and your ability to interpret this is going to be very important. Now, what are we looking for? Why is this so important? Well, remember, Thomas muscle, heart muscle, you've learned the ins and outs of pathophysiology and electrophysiology of the muscle. You understand at this point that there are a lot of things that go into keeping, keeping muscles um, moving. The heart is no different here. Um, very important, cells need oxygen. In the case of MI, especially in the case of MI with... Um, um, coronary occlusion, O2 is uh, deprived or the cells are deprived of O2 and their functionings begin to alter. We know that we go from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism because we're still trying to create uh, energy, but the effects of anaerobic metabolism creates acid and whole metabolites. This is going to lead to cell death, and this is one of the big reasons why you start to have uh, chest pain. Um, oxygenation is not restored until flow gets back to these areas. These changes to the cell occur on a continuum as the EKG changes. So we know that through the process of, of trends that we know typically we see a progression of um, the, the ST segment, the T wave, and then the Q wave. Remember, either an increase in demand or an increase in supply can cause the ischemia and or injury to develop. So that's why we will do the treatment modalities that we are going to, to talk about uh, coming up. Now, it's also very, very important to remember that you do not want to tax the patient any more than possible. You do not want to increase the oxygen demand of uh, the patient's heart. So important things to remember, um, AMI or acute myocardial infarction, these are not static events. 
This is a continuum that extends from normal to fully intact, where you actually see a progression of ST depression, T wave inversion, ST elevation, um, and Q wave development. So you can actually see as you as the patient starts and we the MI starts to extend, you can see changes here. Now it's very important that you do continual 12 lead EKGs, especially when you determine that there are issues. So what we're looking for is three things: ischemia injury, and then infarction. First off, ischemia. You'll see ST depression and symmetrical T wave inversion in some cases. You don't always see a T wave, but this is going to be what you see early on. This is reversible, and can lead, but it can lead to end if left untreated. It's very important. If we identify areas of ischemia, we go ahead and treat meaning we do the things that we need to do in the field, um, including uh, O2 if needed. Remember that this is a problem with occlusion. It's not necessarily a, a oxygen supply problem. If the area was not occluded, the oxygen would be able to get to the tissue. So if they've got an SpO2 of less than 94%, then we may want to consider some low flow oxygen. Um, Aspirin is going to be very, very important because if it is a clot, especially a thrombolytic clot, uh, it's going to uh, keep it from getting bigger. And then also uh, nitrates where we're going to cause vasodilation uh, to help with the flow of blood. And then, of course, uh, uh, pain alleviation with analgesia. The area of ischemia is more negative than the surrounding tissue. Um, so the area of ischemia, repolarization occurs along an abnormal pathway, which in this case is why you would see the T wave inversion. Um, when you think about symptoms, this is where you're really going to see like the sudden unexplained chest pain in some cases, most cases. Now, a lot of times though, you've got to consider this, that patients may not show just the the textbook uh, signs and symptoms. Remember, patients don't always read the textbook. The injured area does not repolarize completely, and so it remains more positive, which this leads to the ST elevation. So if you notice here, this would be the isoelectric line. This is your J point here. Um, so it is actually starting to be elevated. Uh, the T, T wave will remain flipped due to the abnormal pathway, but what we're doing here now is actually interfering with the uh, ability of the ventricle to depolarize and repolarize. And especially in the areas that have, that have been injured, uh, they're not going to react the way they need to. An AMI diagnosis is made in the presence of ST elevation of one millimeter or more. There's also a couple of other important concepts uh, when identifying MIs, right ventricular involvement, and also reciprocal changes. Reciprocal ST segment uh, changes uh, are defined as uh, ST segment depression in leads separate and distinct from leads that reflect ST segment elevation. Um, ST segment depression leads one in AVL um, in relation to two, three in AVF. In other words, the concept of reciprocal change cannot be used if ST segment elevation is present. Essentially, you're looking at a flipped image. The concept of reciprocal change cannot be used in patients with abnormal inner uh, ventricular conduction, uh, including left bundle branch block ventricular pace rhythm, and to a lesser extent, left ventricular hypertrophy uh, via voltage criteria. So here is a graphic uh, 
showing a area that has been extended to the point to where you started with ischemia, then you got an injured area, and then you got an infarcted area. So if you notice here, the area of ischemia causes ST segment depression uh, with or without T-wave inversion, like I mentioned earlier, as a result of altered repolarization. Now you do see here that you do have uh, T-wave inversion and you do have ST uh, segment depression. Now, as injury starts to occur, as injury starts to occur, you see you see the ST segment start to elevate, and then you also start to see the development of a Q wave. And then as you become uh, infarcted, you start to see um, development of deep Q waves. So this is your Q wave right here. And how do I know that it is a Q wave? Because it's the first negatively deflected wave after the P wave. But deep Q waves as a result of absence of depolarization, never a good thing when you have absence of depolarization uh, from the dead tissue and receding currents from opposite uh, sides of the heart. So you actually, this is where the... Um, this is where the axis deviation comes into play. So if this was the left ventricle and you had that area of conduction, it would actually deflect off and probably go rightward. So our goal is to stop the extension of this. We want to be able to identify early when you're ischemic because ischemia can be uh, fixed uh, without lasting result. Once you become injured uh, and especially infarcted, it gets dangerous, more dangerous. So again, this is the same graphic that we noticed earlier. You, you notice the development of the uh, ST elevation as you get worse. So ischemia progresses to injury, progresses to infarction. Again, we want to notice this in our anatomically contiguous areas, as noted with the different colors. In order for you to determine that you have an abnormal Q wave, it's got to be deeper than one third the height of the QRS complex. So, as I said earlier, sometimes you do expect um, a small Q wave. But once it starts to get uh, acute, or uh, I'm sorry, once it starts to get deep and it is at least one third the height of the QRS, it could indicate um, issues. Now, one thing to keep in mind, a Q wave alone uh, may indicate an old MI, but Q waves with ST elevation, this is going to indicate an acute uh, MI. Um, as noticed here, as you start having the ST elevation, as you start in the ST elevation here, you'll start seeing the development of the Q wave here, here, as it gets higher and higher. And then finally it gets to the point where you're infarcted, uh, you have actually uh, have the Q wave there. Um, and the ST uh, segment actually goes back down, but it is not a normal pathway. So again, here's the development of the Q wave with associated ST elevation. Uh, this is just a comparative uh, graphic here of a normal Q wave and a pathologic Q wave. So your normal Q wave we notice is very small. It's nowhere near one third the height of the uh, R wave. Here uh, you see the development of the Q wave that is at least one third the height of the R wave. Now mentioned earlier the J point and this is something that you already should know if you're at this point but your J point and that's going to be the uh, junction point between the QRS complex and the ST segment you need to watch for anomalies on QRS complex uh, on the right side um, 
you need to be able to determine if you've got an increase or a decrease in movement of the um, S segment. So it begins at the J point and terminates at the T wave. Um, if you see uh, um, below the isoelectric line, that's going to indicate ischemia. And then as it starts to rise, that's going to be patterns of injury. Um, this is just an example of a, uh, a lateral wall here and then inferior and probably anterior wall here. Just another graphic here with ST segment elevation in your uh, baseline or your limb leads. You're looking at at least one millimeter above the baseline. And then in your chest leads, at least uh, two millimeters above the baseline. Again, as we've learned before, the T wave is the most dynamic wave. And you may see it peak or tent in shape, uh, especially due to like hyperkalemia that may be associated with the MI um, due to the anaerobic metabolism. Um, you may see it as symmetric or even a broad base T wave. You may see it flip. You may see, um, you may not even see any changes, but you do know that the, the T wave uh, is very dynamic. Now, just to get in your mind what uh, we, we might be looking for if we were to do a right-sided ECG, if we have an inferior MI where we notice ST elevation or STEMI in uh, leads 2, 3, and AVF, which is going to be your inferior part, um, you will want to move um, V4 and move it to the same location except on the right side and print off a of V4R. Look for ST elevation there. And that will indicate whether you've got at least right-sided involvement or not. If you've got right-sided involvement, you need to make sure that you uh, contact med control um, about what to do from there as far as nitrates go because they are contraindicated right-sided involvement. So I do want to make it clear, though, um, a, a inferior MI is not an absolute contraindication for nitrates. You must do the next steps and determine whether there is right ventricular involvement or not. Reciprocal changes, mentioned this earlier, reciprocal changes that refers to the mirror image of an event. So if you have SD elevation, you want to look in the reciprocal leads. And we will discuss reciprocal leads um, and see if you've got uh, the, the uh, opposite. So some of your reciprocal leads, leads 2, 3, AVF, and leads 1 in AVL. So if I've got ST segment elevation in 2, 3, and AVF, which would indicate a uh, inferior MI, then I would want to look in leads 1 in AVL to see if I've got ST depression, which is going to further confirm my diagnosis of uh, acute MI in the field. So... Essentially how this works is that you've got the cameras on opposite sides. So essentially if I were to have a, a patient with leads 2, 3, and AVF, um, AVL, and lead one, they are on the opposite side with the camera. In this image here, electrode A looks at the electrically neutral zone of it and registers the unopposed vector heading away from it. This gives rise to Q wave, which is a positive vector heading away from the electrode causing a negative deflection. Next, it registers the more positive zone of the injury causing ST elevation. Abnormal repolarization causes T wave inversion. Electrode B sees an unopposed vector heading towards a uh, one and gives large R waves. This registers the zones of ischemia injury, more positive heading that way. So uh, this is registering uh, what's coming this way, and this is registering what's going that way. And so that's why there are reciprocal changes there. So if you notice here in leads 2, 3, and AVF, you've got ST depression, 
where you've got ST elevation in leads 1 and AVL. So you've got your contiguous leads here, and then you've got your reciprocal leads to these leads there. Um, other leads, V7 uh, to V9. Now, we, we only notice a V uh, uh, up to V6. So where does V7, V8, V9 come in? So those would actually be the posterior leads. So if we see um, ST depression in leads V1 to V3 without any type of changes in any of the other leads, then we could actually consider that there might be posterior MI just based off of what we know with the reciprocal leads. So ST segment elevation is 2, 3 in AVF for reciprocal changes in leads 1 in AVL. ST segment elevation leads V1 to V3 with reciprocal changes in 2, 3 in AVF. This gives a diagnosis of a posterior wall stemming. Now, this image here is areas of infarct in relation to the leads. So 2, 3 in AVF, that's going to be inferior wall. V1 and V2, V1 and V2, that's going to be um, septal especially, and then V3 and V4, that's anterior wall, and then V5 and V6, that's low lateral, V1 and AVL, that is high lateral. This will conclude part three of uh, the 12 lead lecture. We will continue posting um, lectures throughout this week and next. Um, the next lectures that we're going to discuss are particular areas of infarction and the particular areas we want to look for. Um, and then ACS management followed by other particular things that a 12 lead can tell you. So again, thanks for listening. If you need to contact me, do not hesitate. Nick Ray at scc.edu.